If you work in the ER, you're going to see atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response, a fast, irregular heart rhythm that can cause serious complications if not managed correctly. This condition can lead to hemodynamic instability, including hypotension and poor perfusion, heart failure, and even stroke if not treated properly. Your job as the nurse is to recognize it early, understand why it's dangerous, and know the right interventions to stabilize your patient. By the end of this video, you'll know how to recognize AFib with RVR on an ECG, when to use rate control versus rhythm control, and why that matters, which medications to use in common dosing strategies, and at the end, we'll cover specific nursing tips to help you become the best ER nurse you can be. Let's get started. So, Atrial fibrillation is one of the most common arrhythmias that you're going to see in the ER. The atria contract irregularly, and if it occurs too rapidly, more signals get sent down to the ventricles, leading to an increase in ventricular contractions or heart rate. Normally, the ventricles rely on passive filling before each contraction, meaning there needs to be enough time between each beat for blood to enter the ventricles. But in AFib with RVR, the heart is beating so fast that ventricular filling time is compromised, and that means less blood is pumped with each beat leading to decreased cardiac output. Your patients will then present with hypotension, palpitations, chest discomfort, fatigue, shortness of breath, and dizziness, among other symptoms. The main complications include the patient becoming very hemodynamically unstable, cardiomyopathy, and since blood clots can form in the quivering atria, it can even lead to strokes. Common causes can include sepsis, cardiac disease, electrolyte imbalances, and hyperthyroidism. Sepsis can irritate the heart. Cardiac disease like CHF or CAD can make AFib more likely, and low potassium or magnesium levels increase the risk of arrhythmias. Hyperthyroidism is another big trigger because excess thyroid hormone overstimulates the heart. On an ECG, the classic characteristics of atrial fibrillation include no clear P waves as the atria are quivering, irregularly irregular ventricular contractions, and you'll see fluctuating heart rates on the cardiac monitor. One second, the heart rate is 110, then it's 130, then back down to 115, and so on. This irregular pattern is a hallmark of AFib on an ECG. Here, I wanted to provide an example of an of ECG uh, with AFib. So we can see that there are no clear P waves. And we can see as well that there are the QRS complexes, the R's, are irregular in length from the other. And if you remember, those are some of the clear hallmark findings. No clear P waves and irregularly irregular contractions. When treating AFib with RVR, the first step is to address the underlying issue if there is one. If the patient is septic, then fluids and antibiotics are key. If they have an electrolyte imbalance, correcting low potassium or magnesium can help. If thyroid dysfunction is the cause, treating hyperthyroidism may resolve the AFib. However, as I said, sometimes it'll be a mixture of an underlying issue plus AFib on top, but the underlying issue should be addressed as well. Now, as far as treatment for AFib RVR, there's two methods, either rate control or rhythm control. Let's first start with talking about rhythm control, meaning you are trying to convert the patient back to normal sinus rhythm. The main way of doing uh, rhythm control is through cardioversion, and most sources say that if a patient is very unstable, cardioversion should be attempted. However, in the real world, it's a little different. There is an understanding that for patients with chronic AFib, cardioversion rarely works. And if you are going to cardiovert, the AFib has to be either new onset within 48 hours, or the patient needs to be on anticoagulant with the therapeutic INR. These conditions are because, again, there are those high risks of blood clots forming in the atria. And if you cardiovert the patient back to, if you cardiovert the patient, it comes with the risk of dislodging these clots and the clot moving and it creating a stroke for the patient, right? And then we could do a transesophageal echocardiogram to assess for the presence of blood clots. But in a crashing patient, there's typically no time to do a TEE, right? But again, be mindful the for cardioversion, it needs to be new onset within 48 hours, or the patient needs to be on anticoagulants with a therapeutic INR. And it's all, again, for that risk of blood clot. Now, let's go over to rate control, which is what is usually done in the ER. Essentially, rate control is just giving medications the slow conduction through the AV node and ultimately decrease the heart rate. When this is done, typically you're, you'll aim to obtain a heart rate around the 110s, even a little less, with hemodynamic stability is what we're looking for. When the patient is hypotensive with AFib RVR, as we discussed, it can be as a result of poor filling times of the ventricles. If we give medications to slow the conduction down the AV node, it can give the ventricles time to fill and therefore increase cardiac output and perfusion. But sometimes I have seen that when we give medications, it can make things worse at times. So providers may choose to address the hypotension first with IV fluids and assess whether it had an effect. Of course, be careful when giving IV fluids to heart failure patients, renal patients, and so forth. 
But again, the thought process is that if the heart rate is very high, you bring it down, it's going to give more time to the ventricles for the ventricles to fill and therefore increasing cardiac output. I have seen some times when that doesn't happen, but to avoid that complication specifically, a lot of providers will do a bolus of IV fluids to start treating the blood pressure and then giving the medications to bring that heart rate down. So again, once the BP is under control or interventions like IV fluids have been started, providers will either go with diltiazem, a calcium channel blocker, or metoprolol, a beta blocker. Both of these medications will slow conduction through the AV node. Typically, I see providers choose diltiazem or its brand name cardizem over metoprolol. At least in my perspective, diltiazem seems to work a little better. For cardizem or diltiazem, you'll most likely give 20 milligrams slow IV followed by a 30 milligram PO for longer control. For metoprolol, you'll give between 2.5 to 5 milligrams slow IV as well, followed again by a PO dose for longer control. I do want to include Esmolol here, a beta blocker, because it can sometimes be ordered as a drip after those other medications since, this, since it has a shorter half-life, meaning its effects will wear off quickly after being turned off, which is why it's used that time to see if a patient can tolerate a beta blocker and if they can't, no harm, no foul because its effects will wear off quickly. Now, let's say that the, that the patient received cardizem or metoprolol and it did not work and the patient is still in IFIP RVR and they're still symptomatic, maybe a little hypotensive and so forth. The next medication that is typically given is amiodarone. You'll give a bolus of 150 milligrams IV over 10 to 15 minutes followed by a continuous uh, drip, right? And we've talked about this drip protocol in other videos as well. Besides amiodarone, magnesium can also be given as it has a calming effect on the heart, usually two to four grams over 30 minutes. And by this point, if the patient still remains unstable or if there's any doubts, the provider should have contacted, contacted cardiology. But again, just to summarize the treatment, typically the provider will either go with dolestiasm or mitoprolol. You do the IV dose and then follow by a PO dose for longer control. And if those medications don't seem to produce the desired effects. Another medication that can be added on as a drip is amiodarone and sometimes magnesium can be given as well. If you're finding this helpful and want to save time and energy with mastering the chaos of the ER, check out our book and course. They are packed with everything you need, including foundational material, quizzes, and practical tips to help you feel confident and prepared in the ER. You can also join the channel as a member and gain access to the, to the course by clicking the join button below. You can find the links in the pinned comment and description text below. Now, for some specific nursing tips, I want you to be mindful of using your critical thinking. For example, if the patient who is an AFib with RVR, and they're a little hypotensive, but they have a temperature of 102.5 Fahrenheit, they have some fling pain, and they have some pain with urination, the fast heart rate may be the body's way to compensate them being uh, in sepsis. If you lower the heart rate, it will have severe consequences. Here, you would prioritize IV fluids and antibiotics. And or discuss with your with a team your concerns and CYA in your charting. But use your critical thinking. If someone's um, hyperthermic, showing signs of an infection, it may it may be that the patient that the body is just compensating for the infection, and that's why the high heart rate is um, is there. Once that starts to get treated, once that underlying issue gets to get treated, the heart rate will come down and stabilize itself. And as with any other medications in the ER, except in codes, we don't want to slam them in. When giving, for example, when giving cardizem, the typical 20 milligrams for adults, to be safe, I personally check the BP beforehand, give 10 milligrams slowly, repeat the blood pressure again, expecting to see an improvement in the BP and heart rate. And if so, I then give the other 10 milligrams. And then at the end, I recycle the BP for another check. However, if I give the first 10 and then I repeat the BP, and even though the heart rate went down a bit, but the blood pressure went lower, I'm going to hold the last 10 milligrams and then go talk to the team and let them know uh, what I'm seeing. And again, that's just to be safe. I may still come back and give the give the last 10 milligrams in the span of like a few minutes if the, the BP ended up coming up and everything looking better. But I do it slowly. I just go half and half because the last thing I want is to give the full 20 and then fully just tank the patient. And then that leads to other issues. And uh, we don't want to create other issues for the patient. And now, when prioritizing with AFib RVR patients, they're going to be a priority when they're symptomatic. If they're low BP, feeling palpitations, chest pain, shortness of breath, dizziness, prioritize these patients. I say this because the ER is busy and you'll have many other patients. It's good to know when these patients need to be prioritized, right? Because you can have uh, this patient, you can have an NSTEMI patient, you can have an asthma exacerbation patient, and like a few countless other patients. I just want you to know that when these patients are having these symptoms, prioritize coming over and giving them their medications and seeing how they react. And another important tip is when you're placing an IV, when the patient just first arrived to the ER, 
as an ear you place the IV wherever you can get it, especially when they're unstable. We need IV access for, for ACLS medication. We need IV access for fluids, and we need IV access to even draw labs. So get it where you can when the patient first unless she initially gets there, especially if they're unstable. Once fluids have been given, so forth, so forth, the patient's a little more stable. If they have to go to CT, for example, for a PE study, and you initially got the IV in the hand, you can go back and then replace a new IV in the AC and 18 gauge for the PE study. But in the beginning, prioritize just getting the IV wherever you can. A quick look, wherever it's easy, is pop that IV in. And then at some point, you can go back and replace uh, another IV for whatever intervention or study is ordered. And as always, teamwork makes the dream work. And here at Emergency Chaos, we are proactive, not reactive.